Shalom, everybody, and thank you for joining us for a very special broadcast. In the recent trip to Florida, I was invited to do a podcast by the title of Man of True Worth. It was unlike anything that I've ever done. An intimate, one-on-one broadcast where the interviewer want to ask me any question about the faith, about the conflict, about the new book. And I promise him that I will be candidate. Now you should know that we have placed a small clip of that in the Christian channels. And we were stunned to see so many Christians who just speak anti-Semitic slayers, anti-Israel and anti-Jewish and ultimately anti-God and anti-Messiah. So for us here at Avatami International, we are not going to back down and we are going to speak the truth so that the world will know. Thank you for joining me this very special evening for this very important interview. I'm asking you to share it, to like it, and most Importantly, listen to what I share with the interviewer. And I pray that many, many Christians will hear this message while there is time. Thank you again and your share and likes, allowing this message to expand. And may those who have ears will be able to hear. Shalom, everybody. The Jewish people need healing. We need healing right now. We are traumatized by Christians. We are traumatized right now. You know, I read a report just this morning that 50% of the Jewish people lost non-Jewish friends since October 7th. Those people who profess and proclaim faith in Christ. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Welcome to the Men of True Worth podcast. Uh, Right here, I have a man of true worth, Rabbi Dr. Shapira. Shalom, shalom. Great to be here with you. Shalom, shalom, Rabbi. All right. Uh, Thank you for being here. I really appreciate that. Um, We're going to dive right in. We're going to let the people get to know you a little bit, first of all. Sure. And so... I want to hear a little bit about your story. Where'd you come from? What's the background? Um, wow. yeah. How much time do we have? Well, first of all, thanks thanks for having me here and for your viewers and listeners. It's just terrific to be able to share just a little bit about it. So as you can hear from my thick accent, I wasn't born in Florida. I just got here as quick as I could. Not really. I was born in Israel. I was born in Israel. As you know, Israel became a nation in 1948. So in a way, I am a son of a mini immigrants because prior to 1948, uh, most people, uh, you know, got there with the establishment of the modern state of Israel. Although there were Jewish people in the land all throughout, my family remember what was going on in the 1940s. We had the Holocaust taking place, and I am a product of both the Holocaust and what took place from my mother's side, who uh, was raised, born and raised in Lithuania, in Vilna, uh, the only survivor, truly the only survivor from uh, the line from the Holocaust, uh, suffered just a terrible, terrible things, and, and so forth, to the other side of my family that actually came from the Middle East, from Iraq, where was the one of the largest Jewish communities worldwide at this time. Um, my family was very affluent family in Iraq, in Baghdad. And somehow those two clashes between Europe and the Middle East come to this giant melting pot called Israel. So that's kind of a little bit about how, how we even came about. My my mother was able to escape after the Holocaust, very long journey through Poland, from Poland to Italy, from Italy to the land of Israel, where uh, my father came as a boy. 
He was born in Iraq. So, you know, in one side of the family, they speak Russian and Yiddish, and then the other side, they speak Arabic and Aramaic. And they come together, and that's kind of the the interesting thing about about the state of Israel also, that is a melting pot of different cultures, but it's also unified us as Jews. So I was born right after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, 1973 was a terrible, terrible war. My father is a tank commander. He served... um, and uh, a tank hit, uh, a direct missile hit his tank. He lost uh, his hearing uh, almost 100%. And I was born right into, into that very strong uh, religious family, uh, Zionist family. Um, my grandfather was, uh, because he was a very educated man, he became the uh, assistant mayor become very involved in politics um, and was a personal friend of David Ben-Gurion, the very first prime minister of Israel, uh, established the very first um, settlement in the Negev, south of where the Gaza Strip right now. So we were raised up with this and only much, much later. So I didn't know even anybody was not Jewish. Everybody was Jewish. Everybody's Israeli. And only much, much later in my life, I was even exposed uh, uh, to life outside of Israel. So that's a little bit of just of my background. I have a brother and sister that also f- serve, uh, faithfully served. My, my sister, just a small story about my sister also. She became an officer in the intelligence because of her knowledge of Arabic. So she, it's, it's truly amazing, just kind of a little bit to illustrate about the family. She, uh, as she was about to draft to the IDF, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she didn't give up. She went to the IDF. She became an intelligence officer, and uh, that's kind of the way we were raised up with love to Israel, love to the Jewish people, and a strong, a strong sense of belonging because that's the only thing we know. We were all tzabarim, which means native born and raised in Israel. So that's just a little bit about about where we came from. It's, it's interesting because we are resident Israelis, but you know, our parents. Uh, came from completely different world. If you know the story of the Bible of Abraham, our father who went to Turkey all the way around, he got to, that was the journey of my father. They came by foot. They left Iraq, went to the mountain of Persia by foot. My uncle fell into the ice and was drowning. They had to go save him. They used to take their shoes and put diamonds inside the shoes to smuggle whatever they could just to walk and the exact journey if you know how abraham went around that's exactly the journey of hundreds and hundreds of thousands isn't that amazing which is not only it's incredible if you hear this word in the bible walk walk and you count from the from the beginning of creation you count he heard those words walk walk exactly 1948 years from the creation of the world well, guess what? Israel was established as a nation in 1948 in the Gregorian calendar. Isn't that incredible? So we took the same and the same journey as Abraham, our father, and uh, uh, that is the environment that I was raised in. I, I was uh, growing up in an area called Splendor of Sharon, which is an area in Israel that is very famous for its agriculture oranges and strawberries usually i made it to to school just smelling reeking from oranges just picking the oranges up eating them on the way to school and it's it's a wonderful com- community that made out of a lot of jews from iran from persia iran uh, yemen uh, uh, Iraqi Jews, Kurdistanish Jews, so that's called the Sephardic Jews. They're all descendants from Spain. Each and every one of them was descendant from Spain. So if you go back in gener- generation, 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 our family came from Spain. And we also know what happened in Spain. The Inquisition took place, so Jews kind of dispersed. So that's just a little bit about the story. Oh, this is a, <laughs> that's a, that's an incredible story. It's really cool that you've got a grasp on the, the whole background and everything yeah. that happened. Now, um, 
Before we go too much further, for those that are tuning in early to this video, I do want to mention your new book, uh, The New Hamas. Yes. Um, so this, this book, The New Hamas, you just released yes. it. Uh, so yeah. first of all, they can get this on Amazon. Yes. Um, if they want the hard copy, where do they go? They, do they the go hard copy is on our website. Right. Uh, people can see it on the screen, avatami.org, which will be uh, available for everybody to order. We, we translated this book now in record speed to English, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Korean, Dutch. It's available in countless languages. It's all available on uh, paperback and also available on the Amazon on Kindle on the digital format so they can go to our organization ahavatami.org and get it thank you and so I'll get the links up there but as far as this so um, we'll talk about that book in a little bit but sure I do want to know so we've got your where you came from and and all of this what what about your faith journey? How, yeah. Were you raised a Jew or were yeah. you more of like not practicing no, Jew? No, very practicing. Okay, so you very, were raised extre practicing. Extremely practicing <laughs> on the opposite. You have to understand, the, I'll give an example. Here in America, you get different flavor. You have Reformed Jews, conservative Jews, secular Jews, whatever. But when we were growing up, coming from, especially my family from Iraq, my great grandfather was one of the, the they have those councils of rabbis, and my great grandfather, the original name was Mordecai. He's one of the twelve chief rabbis of Iraq. So this this is one of the highest highest rabbis of Iraq. My my family, to show you how serious the Jewishness is, did not want to compromise the Jewishness. God forbid, they intermarry. My mm -hmm. grandfather and my grandmother are distant cousins. By arranged marriage, he was 27, she was 13. And they got married just to preserve the Jewishness. So you can understand how serious is keeping our faith as Jews. And that's, that's the way we were brought up. Uh, the synagogue in our hometown, my grandfather is responsible for much of the creation of the synagogue even. So he was uh, a pillar in the community, in the Jewish community. And we were raised with this, with the love to the land, for the love to the people, and love for Judaism. Okay, so I would say, uh, for me, being Jewish is not even something I thought about. It's just something that you accept and you live according to it. And there's, there's no even question there. Like, like I told you, I didn't even know what is Christianity. I just know it's something really, really bad and something I need to stay away from. But that was it. My entire world, my entire paradigm is uh, is uh, is Jewish. And even to this day, uh, it, that has never changed and will never change, no matter what. I, I'm not just proud of being Jewish, but I, I love, I can say, I love Judaism and I love everything about this. That's interesting. And then... Um I I don't know a, a whole lot of your story, just what I've heard from Pastor Matt, but um, now you came to the realization of Jesus yeah. Christ being the Messiah yeah. when, and through your own readings, is yeah. that right? Yes, yes. There, there, there have been a few, there have been a few stops along the way, but I, I can tell you, even, even for this, and everybody should understand it, it's not like one day I wake up and I say, hey, Jesus is, is Messiah. It's, it's been pain, painful. And many, many times across this journey, I said, why me? Because, because you know, when a Jew accepts Jesus or his, his name in Hebrew, Yeshua, he, there is a cost. There is a certain cost that involved with this, and it's a very painful cost that uh, people cannot even honestly they cannot even comprehend what is the cost for that it was terrible terrible cost but the one thing i can tell you this even once i realized that i knew that god does not make me a christian i knew that he just wants me to practice judaism in a in a fuller way and even in, in a way that i could not even understand before because look i still do the same thing that I've done before. I still keep kosher. I still daven. I still pray the same prayers. I still lay the feeling. I still do those things. Uh, 
but I do them now from a different lens, from a different perspective, and it's it's something very very important to everybody to understand that when a Jew, at least the way it is in the way I read it and understand the scripture, when a Jew come to faith in Yeshua, he's not becoming a Christian. The Jew have nothing to convert to. A Jew remain a Jew, okay? But the Jew now have a responsibility to take the full calling, a full calling against for the Torah, carrying the, the covenants of God, and also a full responsibility to the Gentiles. And that's the one thing that I think was missing in my life. I had a zero connection with Gentiles until my 20s. Zero connection. My entire world, my entire universe is Jewish. And I, I suppose this is a, one of the great shocking thing for me looking at the outside of my life it's like i had not i didn't even want to to to, to be next to gentiles and now i am going to i had a chance to be in 66 country and really teaching gentiles so you know god have a sense of humor in the way he works because i said i don't want to do anything with the gentiles and now he's sending me to every nation to testify to the gentiles about this Jewish name uh, Yeshua, so it's 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 a journey, and I will say a very painful journey, because I had to endure a lot and enduring a lot, but this adversity I I believe made me a better human being and a better Jew, to be honest. This is interesting. So you. I, I can hear you saying like that you explaining you endured a lot. Um, it makes sense. I understand what you're saying. And you're saying basically you you kind of when you did accept Yeshua, you you received a lot of backlash from the Jewish community. Um, as, and yes. I, I understand. So I wanna, it's not I'm just about the, the. It's not just about, uh, if I may say one one more thing. It's not just receiving backlash. You are, you have to understand. It's being chastised and being mm. uh, cut from the community is something very painful. I'm not just talking here. I'm talking even in Israel. You're talking about families now. Yeah. You're talking about cousins and uncles and, and aunts and, and, and people that, that are your flesh and own blood. And you can actually kind of understand a little bit of the pain of Yeshua also from, from that regard. But, but I will say this. At the same time, Look, it's not something that I say, oh, I'm accepting, and that's it. It took me 15 years to really come out of the closet, so, so to speak. So for 15 years, all what I do is study Judaism intensively. I mean, I already knew Judaism to a large degree, but really seeking to understand why Jews cannot accept him as Messiah. And... And you know, in these 15 years, I understood. I, I really understood, and I was able to identify with Jews. Why cannot accept him as Mashiach? Hey, there's wars, there's famines. We're still being persecuted. All those wonderful promises of Isaiah and and the prophets. Uh, they, they, we can't say they've been fulfilled, and and, and it's, it's it's became very real to me. But you know, in 2013, it was a defining moment. I said, okay, research it. A step on the research is complete. And I'm going to release a book called The Return of the Kosher Pig. And that was my finding that I set on since the year 1999. Since 1999. So I'm sitting on this and, and God says, be courageous and release it to the public in attempt to reconcile with, with this. And that was a book of reconciliation, a plea mostly for the Jewish people. Uh, the, the book became a bestseller, but something very interesting happened here. And, I, and then I understood the problem. Jewish people were like upset. Oh, how dare you use rabbinic literature, meaning Jewish literature, to prove that he can be the Messiah. While Christians, on the other side, they also got very, very angry. So, hey, you claim to be a believer, but you quote all this rabbinical stuff. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in between two worlds. The Christians are angry and the Jews are upset. But, you know, that's, I think, where I understood in this period. The book became, like, very well-known worldwide. 
But I think that's really where I understood the dilemma. Look, 2,000 years ago, if you are a Jew and you say, you can come and say, I believe in Yeshua, nobody questioned your Jewishness. There, there was no question, can you be a Jew and believe in Yeshua 2,000 years? They're all Jews. They're all Jews. Nobody questioned it. But here we are 2,000 years later, and we ask the question, can a Jew believe in Yeshua? In essence, if you're a Jew, if you say, I'm a Jew, and you say, I believe in Yeshua, say, no, no, you're not a Jew, you're Christians. And that's when I understood the problem, that in 2,000 years we separate, when I say me, we, I'm talking about the church, really separate themselves so much from the Jewishness of Paul and Peter. And, you know, when I read them as a Jew for the first time, I'm like, hey, those are good Jews. There's no even a question in my mind whether or not they were good Jews or bad Jews. Those are great Jews, and nobody questioned their Jewishness. But it's make me ask the question, how come now, 2,000 years later, we look at them in such a um, lens, with such a glass, that we think of them as Christians, like Paul is a villain, and Peter, Peter is a marginal Jew, and, and, and Jesus is not really a rabbi. <laughs> and when I look at that, again, at the Bible itself, at the Scripture itself, and I read the words of Yeshua without lens, without bias. Here's the conclusion. It's all Jewish. The first church was Jewish. There were Jewish, the practicing Judaism that did not compromise because of the faith in Yeshua. So I suppose that's become my life mission, to reconcile those things, to turn back the wheel. And it's not so easy. I realized something very quickly that I cannot do it without helping the Gentiles to understand the roots of their own faith. And that's become the mission for, and that's probably going to be the mission until my last day on the face of the earth to bring this reconciliation. So it's interesting. Um, you mentioned you're not Christian. So what does that mean to you? Like, could the Christian, or yes. to call yourself Christian, yeah. or somebody to call themselves yeah. Christian. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. I really appreciate this question. I'll tell you this story. This is a real story. The very first time that people knew that this Jewish guy that is uh, came from a religious background uh, believed in Yeshua, okay? They invited me to church. And I went, I recall, I went to a church service. It was local in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And the, everybody jumped on me in the church. And the very first question they asked me is, how long have you been a Christian? And I could not understand their question. I said, w what do you mean? I'm not a Christian, I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you where it's coming from. It's coming from, from, from the word of Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. He called himself a Pharisee or first from the tribe of Benjamin. And after he had this experience with Jesus in the road to Damascus, he, he speaks and he says, I am a Pharisee. He didn't say, I was a Pharisee. He said, I am still a Pharisee. And this is the way I feel. I, look, I, God did not brought me to the faith to become a Christian because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am under the Torah, whether I like it or not, because I was circumcised on the eighth day. And I lived according to the tradition of Israel. But what he did for me, and I understand, is, is he changed something fundamental. I am not justified by the work of the Torah. I'm not justified by those. I do those things because I want to please my heavenly father who is in heaven. So there is a fundamental change in me, in the way I approach the Torah, okay? But I still believe that as a Jew, I am to live my life according to the, to the Torah. And, and this is the way I look. So when I say I'm not a Christian, I mean it from that perspective. We are under, think about Paul. He's speaking Romans chapter nine. He said the covenant and the promises, uh, and the work is given to the Jewish people. Those covenants are eternal. And therefore, I, I must adhere to these to this covenants. And I live my life according to this covenant as a Jew. A Jew who loves 
Yeshua. Just like this, it says in the book of Acts, in Acts 21, how many tens of thousands of Jews believed and they're all zealots to the law. Let me tell you, I am more zealot right now to the Torah than I've been before Yeshua. Why? Because Yeshua is the greatest rabbi and he was zealots to the law. And if he is my rabbi and he's been zealot to the law, I will be the same way. But do it from another place, from a deeper place in within my heart. All right. So this is this is incredible because I um, I kind of wanted to say, would you feel like it's sort of semantics? It's just a matter of the words that we're using when we're saying, like, are you Christian? And the reason I'm asking is because when they're saying like they're asking, when did you become a Christian? When did you become a Christian? This feels like... Um, well, how do you define that? Because if you define it as you're following Jesus, if you're following Yeshua, if you define it that way, then then would you call yourself Christian? Or is it just because we've hijacked the word? Well, that's a great question. So I, I really actually appreciate this question. So you have to understand something. That's the difference. I, I do follow him. And he's my chief rabbi. But when I look at the Jesus, for example, in Matthew 23, he tell, he tell the Jews, listen to your judges, listen to them, you know, listen to them, but do what they tell you, but don't do as their work, meaning that, yes, listen to their instruction, but come from another place from within your heart. I see something very important. Jesus, or in Hebrew, Yeshua, is not operating in a vacuum. You see, if he would go against Moses' instruction, he could not possibly be the Messiah. He could not be possibly the Messiah. Moses instructed us to listen to our judges, listen to our rabbis, listen to our teachers. So we have many teachers, we have many rabbis. I listen to them too. But Jesus is my chief rabbi, if it makes sense to you. He's operating within a system. And this system have a name. It's called Judaism. So I cannot say, hey, I follow Jesus, but I reject Judaism. It doesn't work like this because he is part of this system. And we see it in so many places, even in the New Testament, that the, the followers of Jesus, for example, just one example in the book of Acts chapter 1 this is the disciples it's tell us they walk the Sabbath day walk well why do we care why is it Sabbath day walk why, why did the disciple care because they understood that there is a system that is called Judaism that define what a Sabbath day war, walk is that so think about this it's a package deal Jesus and Israel and Judaism is actually one entity. And I think that is the, you asked me about the semantic, that's I think the, the, the core fundamental difference between me and most Christians. Most Christians say, I follow Jesus, but I don't care about what Judaism says. Where I would come and say, no, no, if you want to understand what Jesus would, would have taught and what would have explained, you really need to look at that in context. And the context of a name, the context is Judaism. So it's marrying the system to Jesus himself, if it makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. Um, now, you mentioned that you, you've you ended up um, going on teaching and, and reaching out more to Gentiles. So like, uh, so reaching out, so we would say mostly your, your audience has ended up being Christians in the Western world. Is that, would that be right? You know, it started very differently. It started to be 99.999% Jews. But I made a fundamental change about 10, 12 years ago, and I'm going to tell you why. I realized something about the Jewish people. I, I look at this really, truly objectively, which through my own family, how can we talk to Jews at this moment about Jesus? How can we, as, as Christians, Messianic Jews, wh whatever you want to use here, how can we even talk about Jesus to Jewish people when we ourselves do not really understand 
or miss or pr- pr- represent him correctly. It's like I'm going to go and I say to somebody, hey, let me sell you an ice cream, but rather to have a hundred percent dairy, I'm going to give you some cheap substitution. I do believe, and this is something that is difficult, but I, I hope Christians will think about this. The Jesus that we give to the world in Sunday morning, typical church. And again, I'm not here talking about the specific or individual or the, I'm talking mainstream Christianity. In general, that's he not is completely different than the Jesus that walked here 2,000 years ago on the face of the earth. This, this is the truth. The, the, the reality, if Jesus come down right now here, he would not find himself very comfortable on a Sunday service church. He would be much more comfortable going to the Shabbat morning service among our Jewish people. Let, let me give you a few examples. When did Jesus went, did he went to Sunday services? No, he went to Shabbat morning services. Right. He didn't eat pork chops. He didn't paint Easter eggs. He celebrated Passover. He didn't even put a Christmas tree. He celebrated Hanukkah. All of, of these things are found in the New Testament scriptures. And we see that the very early church, the one that led by Jacob, James, was Jewish. So I, I do f- find myself very difficult to go and tell Jews about a Jesus that does not walk with Moses. You see, Jesus and Moses have to walk hand in hand. And you see that in the book of Revelation, for example, he says, then we will sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. You see, Jesus, uh, he, he prophesies more than anything else or using this baseline for his teaching, Moses more than anybody else. So what does it mean today to typical Christian? Does it mean that they have to become Jewish? <laughs> well, to a degree, yes. What I mean by that is because a Gentile is not under the Mosaic law, but he has to have appreciation. Appreciation, at the very least, appreciation to the Jewish ancestry that birthed the Messiah to the world. And not to be against it, not anti this. This is your heritage. If you believe in Jesus, then guess what? The heritage of Israel should become the heritage of the nations. So that's where I feel that we have to right now start this rectification. First, let's have an honest talk with Christians about the real Jesus. And that's the difference. He cannot be just a Lord and Savior. You also have to be a rabbi. He has to be a rabbi as well. Meaning that we walk and live our life outwardly and inwardly in the same way that he did. So where does it start for Christians is, first of all, appreciate their Jewish heritage. This is a starting point. I don't say that Gentiles should become Torah observant Jews. They're not. The scriptures are very, very clear about this. But I think this is where the heart of the Jew should come, to teach the Gentiles, to love the Gentiles, so that they can really appreciate what a rich heritage they have in the Torah, and marry the two. When the Jewish people will see this, then they will make the immediate connection between Jesus to the to Israel. And that's where uh, our challenge is right now. A lot of resistance. But I get to tell you, for the last 10, 15 years, what I've seen is such an opening and such an awakening, which give me a lot of hope for the days ahead. So you believe that that it's uh, that it's important for Gentiles to learn about Judaism. Yes. Um, do Jews need to learn about Jesus? Hundred percent. And the only one who will be able to teach them is the Gentiles. That is the truth. Mm-hmm. You see, I cannot teach Jews about Jesus because they look at me and they say, "You're a Christian." But the church look at me and say, you're an Orthodox Jew. So you see, that, that's kind of the, the difficulty of being where I'm at today. So I, I, I think the, the key, and, and this is something that I want your audience to really listen, 
We are Jewish believers in Yeshua. We consider ourselves Jews. We live a Jewish lifestyle. But the rest of the Jewish world do not see us as such way. They are angry at us. They are upset like we sold our birthright in such a way. We sold our birthright. The only one who can rect rectify Jesus. Remember Jacob. Jacob's name is Israel. The, 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 the garment dipped with blood was given to Jacob in the last 2,000 years by Christians, pogroms, inquisition, holocaust. The only one who can rectify the name of Yeshua among the Jewish people is the Gentiles. So we, as Jewish followers of Yeshua, we need to be the greatest allies of the church and find a remnant who understand that and cheer you on, teach you, love you, encourage you not force you, not condemn you, not to do any of those things because you hold the key. That's why Paul says that the fullness of the Gentiles is the one who's going to lead to Israel's salvation. Thankfully, thankfully, we're seeing this right now. And of course, you see what's happening in Israel right now. The church have to choose. Are they going to bring the Messiah to the Jewish people or not? And that's part of what's happening right now in Israel. Well, if... I think that the challenge that I would want to present is is um, this view from a Christian standpoint. Um, many many Christians would say, um, "Why do why do I need a why do I need to go back into the law, or why do I like say if uh, you know if Galatians five one says stand fast therefore in the liberty where Christ have made us free right why would I be Entangled again in that but, yoke of bondage. Uh, absolutely, and that's a wonderful so. question. And first of all, look, both Paul, Peter, and even Yeshua himself, they call themselves bond servants. Right. They call themselves bond servants. You know, nobody wants to be a servant, right? A slave, but they call it. Sometimes we put ourselves under this servanthood, not for ourselves, but we put ourselves under this servanthood to win those who are truly our slaves. And that's something everybody has to understand. This is greater than the law. Jesus said, one who love is, is, is rather, there's no greater love. There's no greater love. Than, it has nothing to do with you. Whether or not you keep the dietary laws or not, have nothing to do, in my humble opinion, in the salvation of a Gentile. Now, the way you treat your brother, the way you treat, the way you love God, the way you love your brother, have everything to do with this, okay? But here is the question that we are, I, I would present to the, to the every Christian. Do you believe that you're under the new covenant? Yeah. That's a question, right? Here is the problem. The new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31 it says the following, Jeremiah 31, 31. He said, Behold, I have given a new covenant to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. He doesn't yeah. say he's given the new covenant to the church. That's what the Bible says. It's straight from the scriptures. So the, so the new covenant is given to, to, to Israel. So today, in essence, Jesus came. He died upon the cross. And Paul says he died upon the tree in order for you to become engrafted into Israel. You follow, you're, you're being engrafted into Israel. You have not replaced Israel. The church have not replaced Israel. God forbid. They've been engrafted to Israel because the new covenant is not for the foreigner. It's for the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. So look, you are entering into a new house. Okay. And this house have a lot of grace. Let me tell you something. Not the same rules apply for the Gentile and to a Jew in a new house. But shouldn't you at the very least want to have coherence in the house? If you build a house that's called the church, yet Paul says the house is called Israel, we are competing now rather than working together. You follow what I'm saying? And we have two houses. I don't believe that. I believe God come once for all the righteous, Jew and Gentile alike. And he, he is saving all the remnant among the Jews and among the Gentiles. And we're unique. 
we have different roles and responsibility of this house. The responsibility of the Gentiles now is to come into the house of Israel and restore the fallen tabernacle of David. The house has been fallen. We have not had a temple for 2,000 years. The only one who can restore the spiritual tabernacle, the, the real Messiah, the real temple is the Gentiles. So you don't do those things for the sake of anything that have to do with you. You do them for the sake of Messiah name to be restored to the Jewish people. You follow it. Although your action might seem the same, they are not for the same, the same purpose. You are doing it for Zion salvation, as Paul says, so that all of Israel will be saved. Now, from a from a different standpoint, if I shift it a little bit, um, wouldn't there be an argument that, or and you know, do you believe? Do Jews um, that are say the the Orthodox or ultra Orthodox or whoever is is following the law to the letter, doing yes. these things all the time, does not believe that Jesus, or hasn't been taught, doesn't know anything else except Judaism. Right. Um, because they've been raised in it, and they've been brought right, in it. Right, So, why do they need, why do they need Jesus? Or why do they need Yeshua? Or don't, aren't they still under the Old Covenant? Mm. Or how does that work? Well, first of all, let me say it clearly we all need a Mashiach everybody need a Messiah Jew or Gentile alike let me start it remember one number one that every day three times a day every Orthodox Jews pray for the Shekinah to return to Zion because the Shekinah has been departed when the temple has been destroyed. It's every day we're praying it three, three times a day, and it's a prayer that's called the standing prayer. So number one, we as Jews already recognize, recognize, recognize that we need Mashiach. Okay, we do recognize that we need Mashiach. The, the issue is, can we, ex every Jew in the world will tell you today, because you know, Judaism have 13 articles of faith. Number 12 says, I believe in a perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. And even if it delay, I will await his coming every day. Most people star, stop there. But you know what the next uh, benediction said, the next line, he said, if one does not await his coming and does not believe in coming, does not even believe in Moses. Exactly what Jesus says. If you believe Moses, you believe me. So, so you have to understand the core of Judaism. He's a core in the waiting for Mashiach and coming of Mashiach, of the Messiah. We need him desperately. The question is, is the Jesus, I'm not talking about the historical Jesus. I am talking about the Jesus that is loved and revered in the church today. Is the Jesus Jewish people can accept? And I will tell you, no, it cannot be. Because this Jesus is foreign to us. Mm. Look at this right now. We are in the midst of the worst Holocaust since 1948. I can tell you on a personal intimate level that we have reached hundreds of churches. And I told them very simply, I am a Jew who believe in Jesus. Will you allow me to speak about this in your church? About what's happening right now in Israel? And many churches... One or two percent only even allowed to open the doors. And they all said, no, no, no. We don't let outsiders in. Do you have children? I do. Boy or girls? Oh, three girls. Three girls. What would have happened to you if one day your daughter will bring a boy and she will say, will say, introduce you to the boy. And he says, I'm madly in love with your daughter. I want to marry your daughter. But then he go around the corner and tell you, your daughter, I love you with all my heart, but your dad, I can't stand. The wedding will not take place, right? Hmm. Because it's a package deal. Because when you're marrying some, somebody, you're marrying their family. I want you to think about this. The church revering Jesus today, but many rejected 
through a lot of things, theological, historical things, rejecting the family of Jesus. I am the family of Jesus. My family is the family of Jesus. The amount of anti-Semitism we have experienced from Christians even is, is beyond belief. I don't understand it. So I, I, I would say this to you. When the church understand that marrying Jesus is marrying Israel because he's the son of Israel, then we can talk about Jesus returning to the Jewish people. So is that where you feel like that's where the... The importance lies in, in, as Christians, somebody who's not raised in yes. Judaism, doesn't know hardly anything about Judaism. As a Christian, we're kind of, we're, we're rejecting Judaism. And so when we're rejecting Judaism, we're kind of rejecting that, that lineage that Jesus came from and who he it's, is. It's worse than that. All of us know what the replacement geology is, the theology that state that the church replaced Israel. And many, many rejected. Okay, mm. many, many rejected. Praise be to God. But there are still many who accept it through dispensationalism and, and even like a pre-trib ruptures and all of those type of things. We, we don't have time to get to all of those different... They're all anti-Semitic in the end of the day. But let me stress to you there is worse, something much worse uh, in terms of replacement not replacement of Israel with the church, but replacing Yeshua, the mm -hmm. real authentic Yeshua, with a Jesus that we have made in the church to fit us. And to me, that is the greatest thing. Before you go and cry out to the Jewish people, say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think every Christian really need to do something now. And I think even what's happening in Israel now is giving us opportunity. I see so many Christians, and they they cannot even line up. Am I in the Jewish side, and I'm in the Palestinian side? Where am I as a Christian? No, Yeshua is the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. You you follow what we have replaced Jesus with another Jesus. We replaced Yeshua really with another Jesus. So the the challenge for everybody now is to really find a way to connect with the scriptures. And I say, start with the Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Find good teachers, preferably Jewish teachers. Your own pastor here in the church created a program to do that exact thing, to teach pastors how to reconnect from Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and on for that exact reason, so that you make the connection again between Yeshua and Israel, because they are one in the same. Um, there's something that uh, you've alluded to a couple of times, and I want to maybe clarify in my mind. Do you believe that that um, that you are following a different Jesus than what I'm following? Look, you're asking some very uh, significant questions. And I, I don't want to be on your program condemning Christians. It, it's not productive. It's not fruitful. But if you ask me the question, when I first read the New Testament, and that was again many, many years ago, what I read and the Jesus that I saw, the Jesus that I saw when I went to the churches was very different mm -hmm. than the Jesus and the Yeshua I read about, the one that was in the synagogue, the one who ate kosher, the one who kept the Shabbat, the one who quoted Moses again and again. I go sometimes to churches. I take them to the book of Leviticus, and they don't barely know anything about the Torah, the five books of Moses. It's like an afterthought that's the old. You know, even the, the language, calling it the Old Testament. Jesus says, do not think I came to abolish the Torah or the prophet. I came to fulfill it. Not one jot and one of one tittle will pass until the heaven and earth will pass away. Well, heaven and earth are still here. We're still standing here. He spoke about the eternality of the Torah. 
and and this power and i think it's not that we're following necessarily a different jesus i think what's happened is when you start getting to the epistles to like paul for example and and so forth we we look at the lens i always hear by paul said by paul said by paul said. no we need to re-examine paul who was a pharisee in a new light i think if we can straighten out the pauline theology some of the pauline theology we understand why he spoke some like that to the gentiles why he told the gentiles don't do that don't go do a circumcision like the book of galatian he said no 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 don't do that but then he wanted to go and circumcise timothy <laughs> at the same time it seems like he's contradictory so I, I i think that needs to be the entire new testament is my conclusion is very jewish all of it is Jewish at the end of the day. So I think to answer your question, as a result, I'm not trying to cop out of the question, as a result of misunderstanding Paul in such degree, we ended up building another Jesus in the church that not necessarily resemble the one that the scripture is. But thankfully, thankfully, there is going to be a remnant of the church that's going to be... Uh, you know, uh, looking at that, there's a doctor that is studying in our school. Now he's, he's, he has multiple PhDs, and he told me something, and I think this is the most humbling. He said, I spent 50 years in academia, and the most humbling thing for me after 50 years and earning two doctorate degrees is needing to unlearn the things that I learned for 50 years in seminary. So it's not beyond hope. And I don't want to make it sound like everything in Christianity, everything they taught you is bad. It's not true either, okay? But I think certain things that are foundational have to be re-examined that we're going to end us up in a very different Yeshua potentially. Well, this is, uh, this is fascinating stuff. Um, and that's where the questions come from because... Um, like I said, you're, you're getting a lot of questions from ignorance in a standpoint from where I'm coming from. And so when I'm, when I'm asking a question, um, and I want to put the disclaimer out there for anybody watching or listening as well, um, I, don't have a, I don't have a vast knowledge of it. And then, so, and then also I've been raised Christian. Sure. And that's where my, my basis of understanding sure. comes from. So um, these, these questions come from that standpoint. This is yeah. this has been a really interesting conversation. Um, so uh, and this stuff fascinates me. Like I said, I, and we didn't even get to get into the book. <laughs> no, it's <much>. okay. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, it, it's important for everybody to understand this. We're not here to talk about books and this and that. We're really here to understand something much more fundamental. That God does things in the world. I mean, this new Hamas book is, is, is an opportunity. That's why I call it the great organized chaos and the coming of Mashiach. And, and I do want to say this for Christians. This is the opportunity happening now in my home country, which is tragic, is giving opportunity for Christians to ask two fundamental questions. Number one, which side Jesus is in? Okay? Which should be very obvious to everybody. He wasn't a Palestinian. He's a son of Israel. It even says in Isaiah 63 that when Israel suffer, he suffered with Israel. He's in the tunnels. He's suffering with Israel right now. So it's giving an opportunity. And then it's give the opportunity for every church right now to do the right thing. Is to really line themselves. Let's start out of this chaos and tragedy. The Jewish people need healing. We need healing right now. We are traumatized by Christians. We are traumatized right now. You know, I read a report just this morning that 50% of the Jewish people lost non-Jewish friends since October 7th. Those people who profess and proclaim faith in Christ. So I want to challenge everybody. We talk a lot about this connection to family. We are the family of Jesus. And the family now need you. You are the family by the blood of Jesus. You need to know that you are family to us. It's not that complicated. If we know that you are family from us, then we can have a real talk. Let's talk about Jesus. 
okay? But first, before we can preach the Jews, I need to know that you are family to me. It's as simple as that. Then we can talk about anything else. And not just by words, by actions. Right. That's mix. This is, uh, this is really interesting. You mentioned uh, the what's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, the, tr- the tragedy that's happening there in, in Israel. Now, from a standpoint, um, I actually I spent some time in Iraq um, in 2006. Thank uh, you for your in, service. No, uh, thanks. So I was there in 2006. And, and I just remember, um, even if I go back to 2001, when when uh, 9-11 happened here in the mm. States. And, we, and then later on, a few months later, we were watching on TV as we, bombed I, as we bombed Iraq, bombed Baghdad, and things like that, tore down that statue, stuff like that. So when I'm looking at things like that, as now I'm looking at it 20 years later, and I'm like, what was I doing over there? <laughs> Why was I even there yeah, in yeah, Iraq? What yeah. was I doing? Yeah. And it makes, because we get raised in this, this way of life, mm. that we believe that we, we don't see anything else. We don't, we don't see another side to the story sometimes. And, and the reason that I'm talking about this is because when I, when I think about that, and I look back and I say, this was, that was just, uh, you know, like, like you said, like I, I might lose listeners over this or something, but that was idiocy. That was, that was stupid, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. stupidity. The whole thing, right. the whole, like the whole th- me being there, the whole outcome of everything there in Iraq, everything that happened. And at the time I was, you know, I didn't know that. And, you know, people getting killed, things like that. Now, the, the, um, the reason I bring this up is because when I look at things going on in the world, mm. I, I tend to go the route of <laughs> why is, it's so tough because we, we have to, we kind of have to believe that war is, war is unnecessary, is necessary, right. but, but it's hard for me to actually believe that war is necessary. And so this whole thing happening, even the retaliation or stuff like that, w- where do you come down on yeah. that? You know, David Ben-Gurion, when Israel was established as a nation, the very first thing that happened, five nations attacked us. And right. he said, we have to go to war in order to have peace. You have to understand, and this is why I urge everybody, your viewers, to get this book and read it. Our conflict is not with the Palestinian people. The force behind it, the spiritual force. You know, when this came out, I looked at the Bible. Everything, the beheading, the tunnels, the kidnaps, everything being prophesied in the Torah. I put it in front of generals and I showed it to them. Even not believing Jews, Israelis, military people, and they were, they were floored. They were floored to see all of this in the Torah. Okay, all of them prophesied. Everybody have to understand that we are not fighting against flesh and blood here. And Israel cannot win this war on the physical weapons alone. It has to have a spiritual intervention here. So when we're talking about war here and this thing, what are we fighting for? You have to understand what we're fighting for. We are fighting for human race. This is a different war. This is a war for humanity. And everybody have to understand that the, the things that have been done are not new. Okay, they are all prophesied in the Bible. Even the method of killing, the, the ripping of the babies out of the mother womb and the chopping of the heads and all those things. They all been prophesied as a sign that we are entering into the final battle. So right now where we at, there is always a physical picture. But I encourage everybody to not to look at this war through the eyes of the physicality. Understand the spirit behind the war and who is behind it. That's why I wrote this book. It's, it's ultimately going to be a war between the Messiah and Satan himself. And we are just seeing this warming up to this. Anybody think this is going to calm down and quiet down? They don't understand the spiritual forces behind it. So I think for us, 
we have to understand where we are at right now. It's not an even issue of retaliation. This is a plan by Satan to try to disrupt humanity and destroy humanity. What would you say to those who say that, um, you know, the Palestinians are, they're just trying to get their land back um, where they, you know, because they, they were displaced or whatnot in that time um, back in, wow. what was it, 1948 or whatever, yeah. you know, when they were kind of like um, segregated yeah. in a sense. I, I would say, first of all, learn history. Open the history book from, from any reputable thing. First of all, if you want to go way back, Islam is a new religion. Right. It came around in the 7th seventh, uh, seventh century. Who was there? Who was Abraham? Who was Isaac? Who was Jacob? Where David and Solomon? Where was Islam? We cannot be occupier of something that was is giving to us if you are a Bible believer. Let's start there. Given okay. by, given by, by God, God. By, by God himself. Okay, there, there was no Islam. Now, specifically in 1948, 1948, the mandate, the British mandate was to divide this land into two parts. The Jordanian side and the Jewish side. This is very, very simple. 48, 56, 67, 73, 82. All wars that started by the other side in trying to annihilate the Jewish people. We have been in defense, and specifically now on Gaza. In 2005, Israel gave all of Gaza to the Palestinians. We're not governing Gaza. We don't decide who is ruling Gaza. They are all, they have free election. The people of Gaza have chosen the Hamas, receive hundreds of millions of dollars, by the way, from American administration, your tax dollars are paying for that to build, to build Gaza. That could have easily been Singapore. And you know who would be the very first to help them? Us, I, the Israelis. Mm. We would be the very first to cheer for them. But instead of training and teaching and building, they decide to build a nation of terror. And when you read the book, you will understand what is really behind this. So I would say for everybody who think that Israel have been out of Gaza for almost 20 years. And that's why we see them having, what, 50,000 rockets? <laughs> How much money do you need to have to have those rockets? Rather than teaching your children not to hate, not that 70 virgins waiting for you in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, we're fighting with. We're not fighting against people. We're fighting against Satan himself. Now, you mentioned the, this is, this is the land that God gave to Israel. Yes. And then, so, um, the, the whole thing when it happened, when, when the Palestinians were displaced from the land, um, it's, it was originally Israel's land. It was, um, all, and so look, they, before 1948, people should understand, 1800, 1700, 60, right. there were always Jews in the land. There were always Jewish people here in the land. It's not like we never completely left the land. That Everybody have to understand that. So the, the, um, the thing is, so I was, I grew up in northern New Mexico in a, in a 650 acres ranch, okay? in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and so in the mountains i would you know go out and walk around the land <laughs> through the trees and i would find i would find arrowheads and pottery from the native americans from many 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 years previous so i know for a fact that native americans were in this land right right and so this was their land. Right. And then they got, I also know for a fact, you, they got forcibly removed right. from this land. Right. And then eventually it came to be owned by my family and who now, they still live there. And so the, the, the question comes, at what point do we say, if they were to come in and, and take back the land, if Native yes. Americans were to come in and take back the land from my family. Right. Um, you know, I would feel justified, you know, fighting back against them to keep sure. That and so, at I what point you say enough is enough? Enough time it, went by. Yeah, it's like how far back do we well, have to keep going? Uh, I believe that God promises are eternal. 
uh, we, we cannot go against God promises and you should understand the overwhelming evidence that this is all Jewish in the land. If you ever been in Israel, see the archaeology and even the amount of stuff the Palestinians trying to destroy. You know how much they found in the debris that they bring those big, big uh, trolleys for the, you know, to take the, the dirt and they try to destroy Jewish evidence. It's incredible. Everything from the time of Joshua, the time of Joshua on, the time of King David, and further on, Jews were always there. So if you believe in the Bible, you believe in that. And, and look, the, the reality is, 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 is simple. You are leading, living next to millions of people now that do not see the right for you to be even in existence. Right. Everybody needs to remember on October 7th, Simchat Torah, 5,000 rockets hit Israel where 3,000 terrorists came, raped murder, massacred. I want to ask you a question. You're in New Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. It's have a border to Texas, Yes. right? Texas have a border to Mexico. What would happen if Mexico shoot on Houston, 5,000 rockets and kidnap people? I would like to know what United States of America would have done to Mexico. Yeah. We would wipe them from the face of the earth. Right. And you know, they're firing these rockets from inside the hospitals. We are dealing with this. But again, for us as believers, we see those physical horror. But if you see the spiritual, it's magnify everything. And we have to understand the spirit behind all of those things. And the, I suppose the, the, the challenge comes from like, in that case, you know, then we would say who's who's right. Like, but if we if Why we remove all, the Bible, right? Yeah. Even if, so even if you, you, even if you remove that. the Bible, that's what I want to know. If we well, remove the Bible, remove the Bible. Look at the hard facts. Israel give them a sense to self-govern themselves. Right. Okay. Remove the Bible. One religion, believe in the sanctity of life. One religion believe in the sanctity of death. What are you going to choose? You see, in Israel, we don't raise our children to celebrate when even one Palestinian child live. Okay? The terrorists call his mommy and say, hey, I just killed Israeli and a blood on my hand right now. And she said, Allah Akbar. This is the fundamental difference. And this difference is a difference, not just of the Bible, of the God that you serve. My God, your God, is a God of the living, not the God of the dead. That's what the Bible says. So we choose life. Um, I have one more thing, if that's all right. Why are the Jews always persecuted? The, this is a, it's a serious it, question. It, Why is it always It's very, it's very simple. Jews? Because it says in the book of John that salvation will come of the Jews. You understand, when the Jews strive and successful, blessing come to the entire world. A nation of only 10 million people have more Nobel Prizes per capita than any other nation on the face of the earth. Israel was able to be a blessing in so many things, agriculture, technology, uh, health, pioneering. When the Jewish people thrive, light is coming to the world. But Satan doesn't want that. And that's why he is trying to destroy them. The Jewish people thriving mean America is thriving. It means that the world is thriving. And that's why we have to understand right now what it's coming down to. The final showdown, the final battle, that is coming, and that's where, kind of coming back to the earlier discussion that we've been having, that's where we need the help of the church now, of Christians. Find out who you are aligned with, with the God of Israel or with Allah, but make a decision and go all in. Go all in. 
No, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I do want to, we do have to wrap it up, but uh, Rabbi Shapiro, I do have one question, and we can, you can be as brief as you like. Okay. The, how, what can you tell for young men who are, want to follow Christ, want to follow Yeshua better, what would you tell them? You know, the one thing I will tell them, at least from my experience, and I'm not saying I'm better than anybody or anything, but for me, all the odds were against it, against all odds. I am a Jew. I am an observant Jew. I am from a, a Jew, very strong Jewish family, and I had to find the truth. But when I found the truth, I had to do one thing that's very important. I had to become brave. You cannot follow him and not being brave. So the one thing I, I will tell everybody, don't worry about anything else. Take the word of Joshua 1 to heart. Be bold, be strong. And when the word of the Torah of the Lord will not depart from your lips, be brave, be courageous and walk this walk in joy and pride, but truly in conviction. Don't be lukewarm. That's what I say. If you are going to have this conviction, be willing to even give your life for this conviction. And believe me, he will mm -hmm. take the narrow path and he will keep you on this narrow path. Don't compromise. That's amazing. Don't compromise. Thank you Rabbi so much. Rabbi Shapiro, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks. If you made it this way, like, subscribe, buy the new Hamas by Rabbi Dr. Shapiro right here. Thank you very Thank much. You.